Meizu has recently been getting a lot of good press outside of China, primarily because of their MX-4 and MX-4 Pro flagships. Meizu's most recent device, the M1 Note, provides some of the same high-end specifications at a very competitive price. This is my full review of the Meizu M1 Note. Meizu is marketing the M1 Note as a gift to the next generation. Available in five flashy colors and featuring a curved plastic design, the M1 Note definitely looks sharp at first glance. In fact, the design makes the device seem like a larger iPhone 5C. I honestly wasn't sure what to think of the M1 Note's design when I first started using it. Although I first opposed the idea of having a large, glossy plastic slab of a phone, I will say that the design is much more elegant than I expected. Despite being an absolute fingerprint magnet, this glossy plastic actually feels very nice in the hand. Scratch resistance also seems to be pretty good, but I imagine that it will collect a few scratches over time. The curves on the side of the phone make the device comfortable to hold, but are still subtle enough to prevent the device from wobbling on flat surfaces. It is 8.9mm thick at the thickest point, and weighs a fairly light 145 grams. On the back, there's a 13 megapixel Samsung camera with a two-tone flash on the top and also a Meizu logo on the bottom. The micro USB charging port is centered on the bottom, next to the device's primary microphone on the left and speaker grill on the right. The volume keys are on the left side and both feel very responsive. The headphone jack is on the top left corner, next to the device's secondary microphone. Meizu has placed the power button on the top right of the device, making it nearly impossible to reach with a single hand. This button itself also feels very mushy, with much worse responsiveness compared to the volume keys. So instead of putting the power button on the right side of the phone for easy access with your thumb, Meizu has instead repurposed that area for the SIM door. This is really the only major flaw that I can find with the M1 Note's design. Luckily, Meizu's FlyMe OS does support double tap to wake and swipe up to unlock while the display is off, but that doesn't fix the issue of the power button placement. There is a 5 megapixel Omnivision OVS 670 front facing camera at the top of the device. On the bottom, we have a single illuminated home button. The back key is unfortunately on screen, and the multitasking menu can only be accessed with a swipe up from the bottom sides of the display. I'll talk about this change later when I discuss the software experience. If there's one thing that Meizu got right with the M1 Note, it's the display. The 5.5 inch 1080p Sharp IGZO display looks excellent on the M1 Note. The color reproduction is very good and the contrast ratio is excellent. The brightness range is some of the best I've seen, with low being great for dark environments and high being great for sunlight readability. It is coated in Corning Gorilla Glass 3, which does a nice job at resisting scratches. Meizu has also designed the phone with little bezel on the sides. This is really nice because it makes the phone small enough to hold comfortably with a single hand for most users. Unfortunately, the China Unicom model that I was sent is incompatible with AT&T's United States network. Although my model does support GSM 900-1800 MHz and WCDMA 900-1900-2100 MHz, AT&T uses the 850 and 1900 bands. Since T-Mobile uses the 1900 and 2100 bands in areas with LTE coverage and 1700 and 2100 in areas without LTE coverage, you'll be able to get coverage in most areas. The China Unicom model also supports FDD LTE bands 1, 3, and 41, none of which are used in the United States. The other model, which supports TD, SCDMA, and TD LTE, should support up to 2G speeds on both AT&T and T-Mobile networks. As always, I'll leave a link in the description to both a list of 3G networks and LTE networks so you can confirm compatibility with your carrier. Call quality in the M1 Note seem to be about average when using Google Hangouts for VoIP calls. Do keep in mind that I wasn't able to test it with a cellular network, so I cannot comment on actual cellular call quality. For new service or add a line to an existing wireless account, press 2. For information or help with home phone, DSL, or U-burst service, press 3. To check the status of a recent wireless order, press 4. If you are calling about... The side firing speaker on the M1 Note sounds a bit tinty, but does output at a fairly high volume. Having side speakers is good for when setting the phone down on a flat surface, but bad when holding the phone in your hand. The speaker is easily blocked with your right hand. Otherwise, the audio sounds decent for a $200 phone.
The rear 13 megapixel Samsung camera with an f2.2 aperture took some nice images, but it did have some minor color issues. Unless the environment was very well lit, subjects appeared to be occasionally out of focus and the image appeared to have a warm tint. The two-tone flash is also helpful in low light situations because it helps balance the colors, but that's only if you choose to use the flash. There is an option to record slow motion video in up to 480p. Overall, the camera is just okay in my opinion. Images look good, but they're not great. I also recorded a 1080p sample video. What arguably sets the M1 Note apart most from its competitors is its software. Running Meizu's FlyMe OS 4.2, the software experience is much different than traditional Android. To clarify, FlyMe is a fork of Android, and the M1 Note is actually running Android 4.4.4 KitKat at launch. You can think of FlyMe as custom software used by Meizu to differentiate their products, similar to what Xiaomi does with MIUI. Unlike MIUI, however, I didn't find myself preferring FlyMe over stock Android. I'll start off with how navigation is handled. As you may have noticed, there is just one capacitive button on the bottom of the display, as opposed to three. A single press on this button takes you home, while holding it down for a few seconds launches Smart Voice, which is similar to personal assistants like Siri, but available only in Chinese. To open the recent apps tray, you just swipe up from the left or right side of the home button. You can swipe up on individual apps to close them, hold to lock, or swipe down to close everything. I do like that FlyMe shows the foreground app in the tray as well, something that I still really miss in MIUI. This does take some time to get used to, but it's not nearly as annoying as how the back function is handled. Whenever you launch an app in FlyMe, the back key is added to an additional navigation bar on the bottom. This looks really weird since it just feels like a distant cousin to the home button, but also wastes precious screen real estate. I do have to give Meizu some credit for offering additional keys in the same bar in many of their system apps. But then again, why didn't they just use a hamburger icon or menu button for these functions and keep the back button off of the device's screen? The notification shade is actually really nice, with quick toggles being easily accessible towards the top. However, there is no way to access the settings from this shade. So instead of being able to swipe down and tap a handy settings icon, FlyMe treats the settings as an app that you need to access from the home screen. It's an extra step that could have been avoided by keeping the default options. Despite using the device for two weeks, I still often find myself swiping down, hoping to tap a settings button just to find that one does not exist. The system launcher is similar to most Chinese app launchers nowadays, where it does not have an app drawer. Third-party app icons are replaced with FlyMe's own set, which makes the app icons look very nice next to the system apps. If you don't like that, you can change it in the settings. When installing apps from the Google Play Store, the launcher created duplicates for every app that I installed. I had to turn off a setting to add the shortcut to the launcher in the Play Store, but the only way to remove the duplicates for the apps that I had already installed was to completely reinstall the app. I've seen this before on the ZTE Nubia Z7 Mini, and it seems just to be a bug. Thankfully, there are folders to help users sort their apps and also a search function which can be accessed by swiping up on the screen. Speaking of gestures, this phone does have quite a few options. You can double tap to wake the phone, slide up to skip the lock screen and go directly into Android, and also draw different letter gestures to launch specific apps. What I really like about FlyMe is that it allows me to choose which app I want to launch based on the letter that I draw. So, for example, I have the letter C set to the toggle for flashlight. These gestures are also really quick, which is something that we usually don't see. If you do choose to use the lock screen by fiddling with a tricky power button or using double tap to wake, you can easily swipe up to unlock, swipe right to launch specific apps, or swipe left to launch the camera. Meizu has bundled a few useful apps with the M1 Note, including the music and video apps. Although most of the system apps have been localized and fully support English, there are still a few that are only available in Chinese, including the device's app store. Even apps that have been translated still provide a poor experience for non-Chinese users. For example, 
You can't purchase anything in system apps unless you have an Alipay account or a Chinese bank account. Unfortunately, it's almost impossible for foreigners to use these methods of payment. I'm hoping that these apps will eventually be updated to support things like PayPal, but I'm not expecting anything until Meizu starts expanding further outside of China. Most of the system apps are very nice and stable, including the calculator, calendar, camera, clock, and contacts apps. What really stood out to me was actually the music app. Now, unlike Xiaomi's music app, Meizu's music app has a very large online collection that includes both Eastern and Western music. All of these songs can be streamed instantly with unlimited plays and skips. It's also totally ad-free, and all of the music can be downloaded for offline listening. This is all completely free with the M1 Note, however the quality is limited to 128 kilobits per second. Meizu does offer VIP and senior VIP subscriptions to access this music at 320 kilobits per second and 780 kilobits per second, respectively. These subscriptions are actually really cheap as well, costing 20 renminbi for 3 months of VIP and 28 renminbi for 3 months of senior VIP. That's about $3.19 for VIP and $4.47 for senior VIP, which is really cheap compared to the $30 cost of a 3-month Google Play Music All Access Pass. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to test either subscription since I do not have an Alipay account. The settings app on the M1 Note seems to be very bare bones compared to stock Android. The settings categories are on the left side of the screen, which doesn't leave a lot of room for each settings page. This is a problem in many areas since English text does not always fit. For example, you can't see the exact screen on time because the text just does not fit. The system keyboard isn't very good for English speakers, so I installed the Google Keyboard from the Google Play Store instead. Unfortunately, the phone suffers from a serious bug where you can't move the cursor more than once after opening a third-party keyboard. For example, when typing a text message in Google Hangouts and when wanting to edit something, you can only move the cursor once, but then it gets stuck in that position. You have to close the keyboard and then tap where you want to edit again to continue. This affects many third-party apps, and the only current workaround is to use the not-so-good system keyboard. This is a really annoying bug, and I do hope that Meizu will resolve it in the future. The phone also does not ship with Google Apps and services, so you'll be missing out on the Google Play Store, at least out of the box. There is an APK file that you can use to install these apps and services. I'll provide a link to that in the video description. In conclusion, there are a few nice design changes and software additions, but Flyme does take some time to get used to. If you can get past the annoyances and learn to love this forked operating system, then you won't have any issues with the software. Meizu is reportedly working on a new version of FlyMe with Android 5.0 Lollipop, although it is still unclear whether the M1 Note will receive the update. If I had to bet on it, I would say the M1 Note will get an update to Lollipop sometime late spring or early summer. Meizu has been pretty good at keeping their devices updated, and I'm assuming that they'll want to update it to fully take advantage of the 64-bit processor. That 64-bit processor is actually the MediaTek MT6752, which has 8 Cortex-A53 cores clocked at 1.7 GHz. This processor is incredibly powerful, and the device's performance reflects that. The benchmark scores of 40,568 in N22, and 802 for single core, 3,894 for multi core, and Geekbench are very impressive given the phone's price. It does have 2GB of RAM, which should be enough for most people. The Mali T760 MP2 GPU, clocked at 700MHz, provided excellent gaming performance on the M1 Note. Graphic intensive games like Asphalt 8 all play it at a steady frame rate with quick load times. There is just 16 gigabytes of internal storage, which is kind of a disappointment since there is no option for expansion. It should be enough for most users, but keep in mind that you will be pressed to find space if you have a large picture or music collection stored locally on the device. I did test GPS with the M1 Note using offline navigation with Nokia's Here Maps, and it worked just as expected. 
The GPS lock time is about average, usually within about 30 seconds, and the accuracy is also impressive. The M1 Note's non-removable 3140mAh battery should definitely last through a full day of use for many users. It lasted from 7am until about midnight for me, when I was disconnected from a cellular network with 4-5 to five hours of screen on time. That's with the brightness set to 75% and balanced mode being activated. If you're connected to a cellular network, you're going to go through battery quicker, depending on your usage. There is also a power saving mode, but I did not have to use it during my testing. If you purchase the Meizu M1 Note from Panduil, you will receive a Meizu warranty card, a Panduil quick start guide, a SIM door eject tool, a micro USB cable, and a US AC adapter. The Meizu M1 Note is a very nice phone, but has a few minor issues that hold it back. The design is very nice, the display is absolutely gorgeous, and the performance is incredible. However, the rear speaker does sound a tad tinty, the camera is just okay, and the software experience for foreigners is still inferior to stock Android or even MIUI. If you can get past its quirks, the Meizu M1 Note is a nice choice for about $225. If you do want to check it out, there will be links in the description to view both models on Pandawil's website. As always, please make sure to like this video if you found it helpful or informative. And also, please let me know in the comments below what you would change with the software. That is going to be all for this video. Thank you for watching and please be sure to subscribe.